Please allow me to introduce our next speaker, Philip Beach. Philip grew up in Sydney, Nigeria, Malaysia, and Papua New Guinea. When he was deciding on a career, he went to London to study osteopathy and traditional Chinese medicine. And 23 years after leaving New Zealand, he's come back to Wellington and now practicing there. Um, Philip is going to introduce 23 years, is that right? He's been away? Yeah. All right, Philip is going to um, introduce uh, his system of movement and probably going to take us through both theoretical and, and practical applications of that. Um, please join me in welcoming Philip Beach. We'll see if this works. Can you hear me, everyone? Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce um, two concepts to you, or actually three. Uh, one I call archetypal postures. I would suggest that there are many cultures of movement. Uh, there's cultures of stamina, and there's cultures of strength, and endurance, and grace, many different forms of dance. <clears throat> Prior to that, they're fundamental things. I would suggest common to mankind, this idea of looking back to look forwards. So we're going to go through what I would call archetypal postures, introduce those to you. The nice thing about the floor is that if you're on the floor, axiomatically you've got to stand up. One thing leads to the other. So one is a passive resting state that I would suggest to you, most of you in the room are losing access to because of these terrible things that we all overuse. And our whole modern life is predicated on sitting. Um, <clears throat> so if we lose access to sitting, we then lose access to the strength, particular strengths that you need to stand up. And standing up from the floor is a birthright. It's, it's what our species did. We stood up, and we stood up before we had big brains, or fire, <coughs> or language, or tools. You know, standing up was the, the instigator to this whole roller coaster that millions of years later has led to where we are <coughs> now in charge of this planet. So I'll run through the slides. We don't have much time. This normally takes a, at least a full day to talk through. So these are three areas of interest that I'm, I'm studying at the moment. Uh, we'll talk briefly about this one today. I, I'm also interested in how we model movement. Uh, so much of our movement science at the moment is either tissue-based where, you know, so for example, at the moment, fascia is, is very fashionable. So there's a lot of studies on fascia. Uh, <clears throat> we need to step away from different forms of fascism, tissue fascism, and look at whole bodies, whole movement patterns. And, uh, and to do that, you've got to use, I think, embryology and evolutionary biology. I'm also interested in acupuncture because I spent a few years in the UK studying that what were the Chinese trying to map 2,000 years ago with their enigmatic lines? And uh, I've got ideas about that, but that's another day, another story. So, <clears throat> I'm particularly interested in the tune of you. Your, what I call your biomechanical tune. Uh, and I would suggest as you start to lose access to particularly the postures that we're going to go through at lunch over the next couple of days, your system starts to run roughly. And eventually you develop injuries. And then we name each of those injuries. I was at a conference last year and a, a sports doctor talked about 23 diagnoses for running injuries that he'd made over the, the course of that year. 23 named tissues that uh, were causing trouble. I think we're missing something. We're missing this idea of a system that's self-correcting, self-organizing, has been that way for millions of years. And we're trying too hard to break it down and we're moving away because of chairs, and also I would suggest because of shoes, away from 
fundamental givens that we all would have had. So, you know, here's a, a friend of ours, Louis, doing a full squat. It's part of our birthright. And a lot of people in the room here would struggle with that simple posture. Um, up in Wellington, we've just installed one of New Zealand's first porcelain squat toilets. And it is very uh, grounding <laughs> to, to, to realize that uh, you know, it's such a fundamental uh, posture to take up. And in our modern world, we, we're moving away and away from this. And no amount of strength-based training or stretching, I think, recuperates you in the right way. You've got to go back to these fundamental shapes because your system is built around these. So, <clears throat> we're going to have a look at some of these movement sequences, uh, particularly in the, the lunch times. I'll show you what these postures are, but I think uh, why I think they're important. Uh, a little bit more about biomechanical tune. And this is a little bit tongue in cheek. I call them the erectorcisers. And that's ways of getting up and down from the floor. And I can show these to your grandmother or your grandfather, and I can show these to elite athletes. There's, uh, you can adapt these postures. But getting strong from the floor up is one of the most important strengths you can keep, particularly as, as the years go on. So, yeah. this idea of self-correcting. If you, if you stay good, if you stay strong on the floor and strong getting up and down from the floor, yeah, you will reach, you'll, you'll tend to reach your potential in whatever sport you want to do, rather than start to hit injuries, chronic injuries that slow you down. I find from a lot of experience, people recover faster, so if you're a runner, you'll be able to run better the next day, less post-exercise stiffness, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, the up and down from the floor. So looking back in time, there's no doubt that this is the way it was for a long time on this planet. Um, and there are only so many ways humans can sit on the floor. Well, these Fundamentally, I think there's a whole series of cross-legged postures. And these are particularly good postures if it's not too cold, or it's not too wet, or it's not too muddy. You know, without modern form-fitting clothes, to put your naked rear end into cold, wet mud, probably not a good idea. You know, then you would probably go for more, oh, we'll go back, for these squatting type postures where you're keeping some important parts away from the cold wet light. So I, the way I see it, this is one whole class of postures, and this is another whole class of postures. So we're a bit like a musical instrument. Your, your biomechanics are tuned around these two fundamental clades of, of postures. <coughs> a quick look at the embryology of this. Uh, this is an embryo at 28 days, and this structure along here is the interesting one. So this one at the back will become your spine. That's your brain at the top. The heart is in there. That's been removed in this uh, embryo. Uh, but this structure along here is, will form your arms and your legs. So that's the beginning of the arm up here, and the leg is a few days behind in development and it's further down. That's a close-up of it. Interestingly, you see an armpit, you know, the pit at this stage is bigger than the arm itself. So, yeah, don't lose your armpits <laughs> and your groins. <coughs> this ridge is, is one of my favorite things that have been done. It's not very well studied. It's at a very critical stage in embryology, and it encircles the whole embryo a, a bit like a Moebius loop. And it 
turns out that everything that's been touched by that ridge ends up being very, very important to the way your brain sees yourself. So your arms, your hands, your feet, your genitals, your face, your tongue, even your vagus nerve is all that's uh, been on this ridge at this particular stage in embryology. So as I work as an osteopath, I start to see less difference between left and right, top and bottom, arms and legs. To me, it starts to become a whole uh, pattern, a whole network. Uh, the limb starts to form. Uh, you get some cartilage developing, and two muscle masses form, an extensor group and a, a flexor group. And about seven segments contribute to each limb. A couple on the, uh, say five, five principally form the limb. The, the limb's got to emerge from the body wall and it's got to take a big grip of the body. If it was only a couple of segments bit, a big, you, know, you could rip that thing off. It's, it takes a, each limb takes a real big chunk of you as it comes out. Remember, the limb is an extraordinary thing. It's, it's derived from the fins of fish. So where your limbs go, your whole system follows. Just like the fish, the power comes from the, the body, and the fins direct the movement. Well, it's a bit the same for us. You know, our power is generated in, in part, in large part, in the torso, and the limbs amplify that and direct it. And I'm showing you this because if we, so these are the segments that contribute to the limb. And uh, as we come down here, you can see the thumb is up. And at this, at seven weeks, the big toe is up. But then something happens to the lower limb uh, in this time period here, over about the course of a week. And this is all schematic. This is making difficult stuff look easy. Uh, over about a week, the whole lower limb twists. It's a long axis twist. So it would be a bit like getting plasticine and pulling it out and then twisting it. So the top surface twists right down to the bottom surface. And everything gets involved in it. The, the skin, the, uh, the bones, the muscles, the blood vessels, the nerves, the whole lot get torqued, twisted. And that is essential to your ability to walk. Now, you, you get the strongest man or woman you know and say, you know, could you walk on your, um, could you do a handstand walk down to the nearest bar and they wouldn't be able to. It's walking on your hands is really hard because you've got no coil and recoil. Whereas our limbs are tremendously energy efficient because of the, the spring that's set up by this coiling. And like all springs, that's got to be not too tight and not too loose. <clears throat> yeah, the limb gets a little bigger, and this extraordinary structure here, and that, that will start to die off to form your, uh, your fingers and your toes. These are all stories of end stories. Uh, so it's on S, the hands and the feet start to appear, so too do the sense organs, so the, the nose, the eyes, the ears, they are starting to really manifest at this stage as, as the limb buds are really taking off. And remember, they've all been linked with this uh, Wolfian ridge. And at this stage, both the elbow is pointing out and the knee is pointing out. And then uh, it starts to get very tight inside mum. And at full term, your, your ankle here develops so much dorsiflexion that at full term, you're able to take the foot all the way up to the tibia, to the front of the tibia. So you get full dorsiflexion. Okay. 
and, and then you lose a lot of that as you learn to walk. If you, had, if you kept that much dorsiflexion, you'd, you'd never stand up. So you're born with way too much dorsiflexion, and then you start to lose it until you end up with a very, very carefully calibrated angle that's been set over millions of years. And we've comprehensively screwed that up by wearing shoes with heels and by wearing shoes that never stimulate our plantar fascia. The regular stimulation of the plantar fascia through walking on rough terrain is the way this system has self-calibrated over millions of years. So there are these kids, so this little full-term kid, you could get this foot and take it all the way down to here. And then the sitting postures start to emerge, and these postures are, you know, we've all done these postures. They're, they're absolutely part of the way your system is built. See, whereas now, we've We've changed all this. As adults, you know, I can, in the morning, the first thing I do is get out of my bed, which is at this height. So I do that, and I stand up. You know, and then your toilet is this big. And then you sit down for your breakfast or your coffee. And then you sit down on some sort of transport to get to work. And then you might sit and stand all day. You might go for a run, but as soon as you finish your run, you then go back and sit down like this. So hot, wet muscles, like jelly, they start to set, they start to cool down, they start to thicken. Uh, particularly bad with kids where you've got growth hormones going and the bones are elongating inside the developing limb as well. So even, you, know, you go to a gym and the first 10 machines are sitting machines. You sit to exercise. That is really, really stupid. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, and then you sit to get home, then you sit for dinner, and then you go into your lazy boy or a sofa and really let the evening go. You know? <laughs> and unless you, you know, mums with kids, they spend more time on the floor, but most people, in modern, modern um, professional people, place no value on the floor. You know, they, they, might, they might go running, they might have a $5,000 push bike, you know, they can do all sorts of things, but they don't value the floor for the floor. And that causes real biomechanical distress. So, <clears throat> these postures are the way it's, it's been for a long time. You would not want to try and outrun one of these men. You know, it's, um, and their ability to keep this up over years as they, they earn their living. I call this a, a standby posture, you know, right up on the toes like that. You know, see the way the, um, the toes are so extended that the arch here of the foot is right down on the, the ground. That's very normal. You know, most Western people start to get so tight in the plantar fascia here that uh, they can't do this anymore. But gravity, if you give gravity long enough, will do this to your feet. Uh, I think this is a drinking posture. If you've just crossed the, uh, the Saudi desert, uh, and you come across water, that is a religious moment. And you drink by getting right down like that. Uh, well, you either stand up and you do it mouthful by mouthful, you know, but if you're really thirsty, you, you dive down and you go for it. And uh, you have to drink, you have to have your toes up. You know, this posture and then going forwards is the way you drink. So there's something about having your toes up and then bending forwards that uh, allows you to drink. Okay. In a hot, dry climate, this might be a preferred posture. And again, you wouldn't want to try and outwalk one of these men uh, across their terrain. And that's a set of uh, feet that have never seen shoes. 
So I think we're becoming deeply dysfunctional as a society uh, by our, the way we've made shoes so cheap and the way we insist that they're worn all the time. You can't go into a gym without putting your shoes on. You can't go into any restaurant without shoes. Uh, and so I would suggest as a society, if we want to start to correct this, that we've got to place a value on something I call floor life. We've got to start saying, I'm at, I'm at an a airport, I've got an hour and a half for my flight, I'll find a corner and I'll just sit down on the floor. And I would suggest you, here, this weekend, you, know, you could move your chairs to the side, and if you want to, spend some time sitting on the floor. If you don't sit on the floor, you will get stiffer and stiffer. And then, as you start to injure yourself, and all the aches and pains develop, we'll name each one of those aches and pains. You know, we'll give it a technical Latin name, and then we'll try and stretch it or inject it or you know, surgically do something to the named part. But if you're out of tune, then something else will give way, and then something else, and then something else. You know, whereas if you can tune your physique up, you're loading the dice in your fake. There's no guarantees, but in my experience, that's the way it turns out. So that's, that's that. I'm ready for questions. Thank you.